Behold, there are ancient musical truths hidden away in modern digital artifacts. Never underestimate the power of Google search in unearthing new digital artifacts. I've recently found the answers to several intriguing questions regarding both ancient music and the lyres of antiquity, right here in my lounge on my laptop. Firstly, an ancient description of an actual lyre playing technique, which I had previously inferred myself from illustrations of ancient lyre players, and which is featured in all my albums. And this is alternating between finger plucked and plectrum plucked tones. And behold, I found a description of this very same technique in a passage by the ancient Roman poet Virgil in his poem The Enid, Book 6, line 645. There Orpheus too, the long-robed priest of Thrace, accompanies their voices with the seven-note scale, playing now with fingers, now with the ivory quill. Again, clear as day, playing first of all with the fingers, the plectrum, the ivory quill. Also of relevance to my musical quest into antiquity, this amazing little passage, original text by Virgil, clearly mentions the specific use of a heptatonic scale. A seven note scale, presumably one of the ancient Greek modes which the Romans robbed from the Greeks. Um, there is another ancient literary reference by the second century Roman poet and prose writer, if I can pronounce his name, Apuleius, in which he describes a sculpture of a youth playing a kithara. His left hand, fingers apart, set the strings going, whilst the right hand moves the plectrum toward the kithara, as if ready to strike it when the voice has paused in its song. Now this ancient text suggests that the melody was plucked with the fingers of the left hand doubling the vocal line, and then the strums with the plectrum in the right hand were used to fill the spaces between the vocal lines, so as bridges or as rhythmic beats in between verses of the song. A fascinating gem of information hidden there. Another ancient literary gem I've discovered, this time from ancient Greece, by um, Philostratus the Younger, provides a strikingly similar vivid description of ancient lyre playing technique. In this account of Orpheus, there is a description of the simultaneous an alternating use of plectrum and finger pluck tones. Also there is a mention of the position in which the lyre was held and even describes how Orpheus beats the time with his foot on the ground. So this is by um, Philostratus the Younger in a text called Imagines and it's um, uh, book six in the description of Orpheus. Orpheus sits there the down of a first beard spreading over his cheeks, the tiara bright with gold standing erect upon his head, his eye tender yet alert and divinely inspired as his mind ever reaches out to divine themes. Perhaps even now he is singing a song. Indeed, his eyebrows seem to indicate the sense of what he sings. His garments change colour with his various motions. His left foot resting on the ground supports the lyre, which rests upon his thigh. There we are, the position of the lyre being held. His right foot marks the time by beating the ground with its sandal. And of the hands, the right one is firmly grasping the plectrum, gives close heed to the strings. The elbow extended and the wrist bent inward, while the left with straight fingers strikes the strings. So there we have a description of the um, right hand grasping the plectrum, um, a close heed to the strings of the notes, so it's used in plectrum tones, uh, while the, uh, le with, the le with the left hand, the fingers strike the strings at the same time. Again, a fascinating, um, a fascinating passage which can indicate the use of harmony in, in antiquity. Here is yet another ancient literary gem, this time by Philostratus the Elder. The passage describes how the left hand fingers are playing at the same time as the plectrum in the right hand. Again, yet more possible evidence for the use of harmony in antiquity. 
Um, the description begins with a very vivid description of the ancient Greek chalice, or the tortoiseshell form of lyre. The passage is um, by Philostratus the Elder in the book Imagines, um, book 1, verse 10, Amphion. The clever device of the lyre, as it is said, was invented by Hermes, who constructed it of two horns and a crossbar and a tortoiseshell, and he presented it first to Apollo and the Muses, then to Amphion of Thebes, and Amphion, in so much as the Thebes of his day was not yet a walled city, has directed his music to the stones, and the stones run together when they hear him. This is the subject of the painting. Look carefully at the lyre first, to see if it is painted faithfully. The horn is the horn of a leaping goat, as the poets say, and it is used by the musician for his lyre, and by the bowman for his bow. The horns, you observe, are black and jagged, and formidable for attack. All the wood required for the lyre is of boxwood, firm and free from knots. There is no ivory anywhere about the lyre, for men did not yet know whether the elephant or the use they were to make of its tusks. The tortoise shell is black, but its portrayal is accurate and true to nature, in that the surface is covered with irregular circles which touch each other and have yellow eyes, and the lower ends of the strings below the bridge lie close to the shell and are attached to knobs, while between the bridge and the crossbar the strings seem to be without support, this arrangement of the strings being apparently best adapted for keeping them stretched taut on the lyre. And what is Amphion saying? Certainly he keeps his mind intent on the harp and shows his teeth a little, just enough for a singer. No doubt he is singing a hymn to earth because she, creator, mother of all things, is giving him wall is giving him his walls, which already are rising of their own accord. His hair is lovely and truthfully depicted, falling as it does in disorder on his forehead, and mingling with the downy beard beside the ear, and showing a glint of gold, but it is lovelier still where it is held by the headband, the headband wrought by the graces. A, love, a most lovely ornament, as the poets of the secret verses say, and quite in keeping with the lyre. My own opinion is that, the, is that Hermes gave Amphion both these gifts, both the lyre and the headband, because he was overcome by love for him. And the Chalonis he wears, perhaps that also came from Hermes, for its colour does not remain the same, but changes and takes on all the use of a rainbow. Amphion is seated on a low mound, beating time with his foot, and smites the strings with his right hand. His left hand is playing too, with fingers extended straight, a conception which I should have thought only plastic art would venture. Well, how about the stones? They all run together towards the singing, they listen, and they become a wall. At one point the wall is finished, at another it is rising, at still another the foundation is just laid. The stones are eager in rivalry, and happy and devoted slaves of music, and the wall has seven gates, as the strings of the lyre are seven. From this passage, and um, the most fascinating thing is, uh, there is proof that the ancient Greek tortoiseshell form lyre, known as the chalice, was also sometimes made from wood in the form of a tortoise shell. Um, to just go back to that specific paragraph um, which mentions this, all the wood required for the lyre is of boxwood, firm and free from knots. The tortoise shell is black, but its portrayal, its portrayal in wood in other words, is accurate and true to nature, and that the surface is covered with irregular circles which touch each other and have yellow eyes. After some further research, I also found the following fascinating details regarding the ancient Greek poet Terapandos of Lesbos, whose pupil, Kepion, was said in the ancient literary sources to have substituted the tortoise shell for a wooden resonator in the form of the tortoise shell to add richness to the tone of the instrument. This improved version of the tortoise shell lyre, attributed to Kepion, was named Asias probably in reference to its original province from Asia Minor. Yet another fascinating digital artefact I found in my searches on Google 
um, is some evidence towards um, the what might be the buzzing timbre of the original lyres of antiquity. Indeed, I have argued in several of my other posts throughout my website, ancientlyre.com, that it is more than likely that a subtle buzzing timbre was quite common um, to the tone of most of the lyres of antiquity. Because rather than having the sharp edged modern guitar style bridge, which creates a pure harp like tone, almost all the detailed depictions of the actual lyre bridges used in antiquity tend to show a much wider, bent shaped top of the bridge. And the main consequence of this shape of bridge is that due to the greater surface area in which the vibrating portion of the strings rests, there will be a subtle sitar-like buzzing quality to the tone as the vibration is transmitted through the bridge to the resonating body of the lyre. Indeed, this buzzing quality is the main feature of a, a lyre still played in Africa today called the Ethiopian Begina, an archaic ten-string bass lyre. And the tone is very similar to that of the Indian sitar. And regarding the Indian sitar, there is actually a word used to describe this unique, subtle buzzing timbre, where in India it's called Jivari. I recently found at least some circumstantial evidence to back up my observations in an ancient Greek story which has come down to us from several ancient sources, including Plato and later the Roman poet Virgil, which likens the timbre, the tone of the kithara, to that of the buzz of the cricket-like insect known as the cicada. The story is that, is that of the expert kithara player, you. <coughs> Eunomus and the Cicada. Eunomus and Aristo of Regium were contending on the lyre for the musical prize at the Pythian Games. Phobus, god of Delphi, Locrian, Eunomus, set up this Cicada in your honour, an appropriate symbol, symbol of his victory. He was competing in the lyre contest against his rival, Sparthes, and the strings resounded as he plucked them with the plectrum. A warm string began to buzz with a hoarse rattle and spoil the true melody of the music. Then, a sweet-voiced creature, a cicada, flew chirping onto the lyre to supply with its own song the broken string. Recruited to follow the rules of musical sound, it flew down from the high glades to bring us aid with its chirping song. Accordingly, so that the honour due to you, Cicada, O Holy God, may last undiminished. On top of the lyre she sits here herself, a minstrel in bronze. The buzz of the Cicada matched the tone of the broken lyre string so perfectly that Eunomus could finish his piece and win the Kithara contest. Now, why would the distinctively buzzing tone of the Cicada be featured in this classic ancient Greek story, if the buzzing quality was not also in some way a unique feature of the actual original timbre of the ancient Greek kithara itself. The story would make no sense at all if the original timbre of the ancient Greek lyres were all pure, clear and more harp-like. So to summarise the significance of digital artefacts in musical archaeology. In this brave new digital age, there are probably the answers to so many more of the so far unanswered questions of musical archaeology already out there on the internet. It just takes a bit of luck and the right person to be able to find and above all to interpret these new digital artefacts.